everybody. I know that we will have more people joining as we go along, but uh, just like to respect the time uh, that we have today. Uh, my name is Jane Vals. I'm the executive director of the GCC Board Directors Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this GCC BDI webinar on the topic of corporate governance and mitigating risk during the coronavirus, which we're running in collaboration with the Financial Academy in Riyadh, and I'm going to be your moderator today. Um, this is the fifth webinar. Um, Nor, could you move to the next slide? This is the fifth webinar in a series of three webinars that the GCC Board Directors Institute has been running for our members and partners um, around this subject of the coronavirus and its impact. Um, and this is by far our most popular webinar to date. Um, we have over 200 people joining us right now, um, and I think more to come. It's my privilege, nor the next slide, please, uh, to introduce our speaker today, His Excellency Mohammed El Kuwais, Chairman of the Board of the Capital Market Authority of Saudi Arabia. Your Excellency, welcome, and thank you for joining us today for this important webinar. Thank you for having me. Today, uh, we're going to be looking at how the ongoing coronavirus pandemic is testing the foundations of modern society and the corporate world. Boards around the world are having to rethink their usual working practices and policies, including their corporate governance and risk management mechanisms. COVID-19 represents a crisis for nearly every board today, doesn't matter how small or how big the organization. Health and safety of employees, broken supply chains, liquidity concerns, financial strains, remote working, the list is endless. What organizations do now and how they respond to the impact of COVID-19 is vital. In times of crisis, rational long-term objectives are often forgotten. So as boards of directors and C-suite executives, are we focusing on the right things? What's the place of good governance at a time like this? These are some of the questions that we are going to be asking His Excellency uh, today. But first of all, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, we are in webinar mode, so participants' videos are off. You can see His Excellency and myself and our co-hosts, Nora and Lama, who are the technical backup for us, um, but their videos are off as well. And your microphones are on mute. But we would like you to send as many questions as you wish, and you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to do that. Please don't use the chat to send questions. We'd rather you use the Q&A, and then we'll try to take as many of your questions as we can. We've planned around one hour for this webinar. We're going to have a discussion with His Excellency for around 25 to 30 minutes, and then we'll leave as much time but 30 minutes for questions and answers at the end. We've also been given permission to record this webinar, so we will be able to share a copy with you afterwards. So without more ado, nor we don't need the slides any longer, um, let's move into our discussion. Your Excellency, the financial crisis of 2007-8 revealed severe shortcomings in corporate governance. When most needed, the existing standards failed to provide the checks and balances the companies needed in order to cultivate the sound business practices. So the first question we have for you today is, what is the role of the board at such an unprecedented time? At this unprecedented time, what should the boards of listed companies be considering and what is the CMA doing to support them? Well, thank you very much, Jane, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I would first like to thank you and uh, the kind folks at BDI for organizing this. I would also like to thank our hosts, uh, the Financial Academy, who would also like to congratulate uh, with the issuance of the uh, Council of Ministers resolution this week, uh, making them a new independent entity. And I hope both them and yourselves continue to be a beacon for education and awareness um, in the broader market. Um, well, this must certainly be an unprecedented time for companies and boards, uh, both in Saudi Arabia and around the world. Um, and given the uncertainty that surrounds these challenging times, um, it may be helpful to keep a few priorities and guiding principles in mind for boards. Uh, now, from the standpoint of listed companies, which I will possibly um, focus my uh, remark, I would say there are five key priorities. Um, I will list them first, and then I'll elaborate a little bit on what each one of them may entail for businesses. Uh, then I'll uh, touch a little bit on the 
what the CMA has been doing uh, to support uh, on each priority. Uh, these priorities are really health and safety, number one, business continuity, number two, uh, cash flow and liquidity is number three, uh, communication and disclosure, and of course, uh, strategy and recovery, which we all uh, hope to achieve sooner rather than later. Um, if we first start with the issue of health and safety, uh, we must first remember that uh, COVID-19 is first and foremost a health crisis. Uh, and boards should keep this in mind. Uh, they should recognize that they have a duty to maintain the health and safety of their employees uh, and of society as a whole. Um, we believe this can be implemented by ensuring that uh, their companies adhere to remote working policies for staff and by ensuring that the staff receive the technical and also the psychological support they need during the remote working period. Uh, for essential staff, not working from home, of which there are several, boards should also ensure that their company applies sufficient additional precautions to maintain both the health and the safety of the staff and society more broadly. Uh, if we move to the second issue, which is the issue of uh, business continuity, it, in this regard, I think boards should determine if business continuity plans are in place and if they're still appropriate, given the current circumstances and context. Uh, by now, I would imagine boards should have a fairly good sense uh, if the business continuity plan in your business has functioned well or not. Um, however, uh, as the lockdown extends, companies may start to face second and third order business continuity issues, which boards will need to prepare for in advance and need to help executives prepare for. Uh, these include things like supply chains, investor communication, uh, uh, among many others. Um, if I move to the third issue, which is uh, cash flow and liquidity, um, in this regard, I would say boards should regularly review with executives both the near term and the longer term financial impact of the pandemics. And I think the key word here is around frequency. Um, it has also become clear that one of the stress factors for businesses in these times is adequate cash flow. This is why boards should ensure that their businesses have sufficient cash flow and liquidity to operate and to assist them with funding uh, as needed. Um, the fourth point is really communication and disclosure. Um, because in these uncertain circumstances, firms and individuals have a natural tendency to shut down communication. Uh, in fact, in this situation, it is even more important to have adequate communication to build both confidence with investors, with clients, with regulators, and with all other uh, stakeholders. Um, we believe that boards should oversee the commu company's communication strategy and ensure that strategic communication is carried out and administered. Uh, we have noticed from our standpoint that the public distinguishes very clearly between companies based on the quality, the frequency, and the transparency of their disclosure. Uh, let investors know how you're addressing the situation. Let them know how this is impacting you. It also serves in combating rumors, which are another byproduct of these circumstances. Um, the fifth and really the final point is strategy and recovery. Um, and this is the area that boards should spend the most time on. Uh, in this regard, I would say most boards should be familiar by now with how to engage in strategy in steady state situations. But in this current context, and given the high degree of uncertainty around the business implications, boards should get comfortable with a more iterative and scenario-based approach to strategy. This will require increasing the frequency of interactions around strategy. It will also require the ability to act based on imperfect information. Uh, and it will need to cover the implications, both the opportunities and the risks during the crisis and after we emerge, hopefully thereafter. Um, if we then move a little bit to what we in the CMA have been doing to support listed companies, we've really moved on all five areas, with the exception of strategy, which remains the sole domain of companies' boards. So if we start on the area of health and safety, uh, first we instructed our companies and those of listed companies and, and our own employees to work from home to help reduce the spread of the coronavirus. I'm speaking to you now, as I'm sure everyone else is, from home um, with a uh, slightly longer beard uh, 
um, which I've committed to not shaving until we all uh, get out of this uh, safely. Um, we also suspended attending physical general assembly meetings and we instructed listed firms to continue shareholder meetings using electronic voting and electronic proxies. And we reduced trading hours for the markets, which are now from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. instead of the normal 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, on the area of business continuity, uh, we uh, reminded financial institutions to uh, review and activate their business continuity plans and to leverage their technology to ensure their business continuity uh, uh, remains intact in the financial market. And for certain critical infrastructure providers like Tadawal and other market infrastructure providers, we engaged more closely with, business with their business continuity plans to ensure both their sufficiency and their uh, uh, adequateness. And uh, so far, I think it, it, things have gone rather well from a business continuity standpoint. Um, on a, a, a limited basis, we've continued to permit uh, movement of certain essential staff in the financial market and financial institutions. Um, and we, of course, suspended uh, a freezing of accounts in accordance with uh, our instructions for investment accounts, um, particularly in certain cases like lapsed identification. And this is in order to ensure that investors are uh, not frozen out of their investment accounts. Um, on the area of cash flow and liquidity, which is the core uh, uh, aid that the financial market uh, can supply, the, main, the CMA's main contribution is to ensure that markets remain open and orderly throughout the process, both as a vehicle for financing of businesses, as well as a source of vital liquidity for investors. Uh, we continue to work on uh, requests uh, for financing from companies, uh, as normal, albeit uh, remotely. Um, and finally, on the area of communication and disclosure, we started by engaging with listed companies to make sure that they disclose the effects of COVID-19 on their business. Um, as a result, we've already started to see over the last week a, a, a flow of information on the subject for companies. Uh, we are also highly encouraging companies to keep this flow ongoing as the situation unfolds. Uh, we continue to require companies to meet their disclosure requirements, given the importance of timely communication in this time. However, we recognize the urgency of the situation, and we did provide some leeway for listed companies with respect to statutory deadlines uh, to disclose their annual reports, uh, the financial, their annual financial statements, and those, uh, and as well as those of the first quarter. Um, we're continuing to evaluate the situation and the need for any additional leeway uh, as we receive any requests from listed firms, uh, either today or in other engagements. Um, we also accelerated our engagement process with market participants. Uh, we started by holding uh, separate workshops with listed firms and financial institutions to both answer their questions as well as to answer any concerns they might have. And uh, maybe this is a good opportunity to mention that we also uh, uh, created a dedicated COVID-19 page on our website with all of the requisite updates, uh, which are actually uh, frequently updated. And uh, we continue to encourage market participants to reach out to us if, at any time if they need support. And all of the contacts are on our website. I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Jane. Trying to, there we go. I'm sorry, I had myself muted while you were talking. Thank you, Your Excellency. That was a very comprehensive um, uh, response, I think. And um, we're beginning to get some questions, but we'll, we'll, we'll take those at the end. Um, I'd like to just move on about uh, how you see the risk of COVID-19. Do you see it as a systemic risk? Um, and what do you think boards should be doing right now to mitigate their risks? Well, um, um, systemic, systemic risks really describes an event that can spark a domino effect in either a specific industry or on the broader economy. Uh, in this regard, uh, I would say COVID-19 clearly uh, meets the criteria of a systemic risk. Um, 
while it's still early in the process to see the full systematic impact of COVID-19, because we must remember that we're still living in the early health stages of, uh, uh, of the, the COVID crisis, and the full financial and economic impact are yet to be uh, uh, borne out. Um, we will start to see some of the impact when listed companies start to announce their profits. Um, this is actually given markets like Saudi Arabia, which continue to require quarterly financial uh, disclosures, somewhat of an advantage over markets that have biannual disclosure requirements. Um, and while the system systemic relevance of COVID-19 is certainly quite clear, the magnitude and the duration are still quite uncertain. Um, this is why I think boards uh, should consider an active scenario planning based approach to make sure that the company is uh, ready for different outcomes. Uh, in this regard, I would say that uh, the main role of the board should be to focus on two things. One is to help match the variability of revenues with the variability in costs and to help plug the gaps where they may arise and where they may be needed, both in terms of revenue, in terms of cost, as well as in terms of financing. Um, and the second priority, I would say, for boards uh, is to help widen the perspective of management, both in terms of the risks that are being confronted and the solutions that may be available. Uh, we've actually seen many businesses that have found unique solutions on both the cost side, the revenue side, and the financing side by first asking uh, unexpected questions. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge task for companies. Um, we ran a scenario planning tutorial yesterday, and uh, I think it's a key uh, key need for boards at the moment to look at those different scenarios and, and look at the long term. Um, we're being told, and you've mentioned it already, that in times of crisis, communication is key. How should boards be engaging at this time with their shareholders? Should they be planning their AGMs as normal, or should they be postponing them? Well, um, uh, with respect to engaging with shareholders, I'd first like to say that in Saudi Arabia, and given the relatively concentrated level of ownership that we see uh, in publicly listed firms, that communicating uh, with shareholders is less challenging since many of the board members direct themselves directly represent the, these ownership interests in the companies. The situation will be somewhat different in other markets and other companies where ownership is a little bit fragmented. Um, having said that, and as we discussed in our previous question, and as you mentioned earlier, uh, communication in these situations is very, very important, both to engage with all stakeholders, including shareholders. And for that reason, that's why AGMs are continuing with the same procedures as before, but taking into account the precautionary procedures uh, of being held uh, remotely. Um, in this regard, I'd like to say that uh, Saudi Arabia was actually the first country in the world to mandate that listed companies offer electronic voting to shareholders. And by now, shareholders are quite comfortable with the electronic voting process. For example, um, in the first half of 2019, uh, before anyone ever heard of COVID-19, 86% of votes uh, in shareholder meetings of listed firms were already cast electronically. Um, in, in addition to voting, uh, I would urge companies to engage with technology platforms in offering video conferencing and webcasting uh, for their shareholder meetings, which has become increasingly relevant and uh, helpful. Uh, maybe I can mention one more thing with respect to uh, shareholder uh, engagement. Um, and in these uh, particular circumstances, companies should be looking to activate their investor relations function. Um, because their role becomes even more important in these situations, both to proactively communicate with shareholders as well as to respond to questions uh, and concerns. We've got quite a few investor relations officers on the, on the webinar today, so I'm sure they'll be pleased to hear that. Um, there's just one question which maybe is relevant right now. Um, the question is, will the CMA issue a circular to detail the e-voting process for private funds, especially real estate funds? Does that question uh, make sense? Yes, it, it, it does very much. Uh, I think we have uh, been uh, primarily focused on 
um, the, uh, uh, the voting and the e-voting process for publicly listed firms. Uh, uh, I think we have started to receive uh, requests and queries with respect to what the best process is for uh, non-publicly uh, uh, rated entities from our standpoint and regulatory authorities that mainly relates to um, private funds. And I think we're still evaluating uh, uh, this process to try and decide what the best course action uh, could be. However, what I would like to mention that in most private funds, um, uh, uh, shareholder engagement and the frequency of shareholder engagement, particularly on private funds, is much less in terms of frequency as it is in uh, company boards, both in terms of requirement and in terms of practice. So the urgency may be less severe than what you would see in publicly traded companies. Thank you. Um, Your Excellency, um, I'm concerned that at such times, companies throw best practice and good corporate governance out of the window. Important decisions are being made right now by boards without necessarily having adequate information. And these decisions may have long-term consequences for the company, for the country. What do you think is the importance of good corporate governance at such a time? Well, I, um, I really share your concern, Jane, and uh, I think the situation is a very delicate one uh, where you need to balance between uh, the urgent need for action and decisiveness on the one hand and between the importance of well-reasoned, thoughtful, and adequate debate uh, on the other hand. And while there's no magic bullet, uh, maybe I can share a few uh, pointers that I, I think are quite relevant in these circumstances. I think first and foremost, I would say follow the rules. Um, because even in these uh, uh, circumstances, I think rules are meant to uh, discipline uh, both companies, boards, and, and executives. As a matter of fact, I would say in some cases, we're enforcing the rules even more vigorously in this context uh, with respect to things like insider trading, market manipulation, and, and corporate malfeasance. So the first point I would say is just follow the rules. Uh, the, the, the government is becoming increasingly flexible with rules that are very, very difficult to apply with to try and provide exemptions and exclusions, but uh, outside of those confines, I think one should follow the rules. I think the my second point is not to override um, the authority matrix. Most listed companies should be familiar by now with having an authority matrix for what the board is responsible to do, what the executives are responsible to do, and, and, and so on. And I think it is quite important that executives not override uh, this authority matrix. What they can do is to seek uh, exceptional powers um, where they're uh, needed, and I think that is quite uh, frequent, quite expected. Both executives should expect to ask for it and boards should uh, expect to grant uh, additional authorities in these uh, circumstances. However, you want to make sure that these authorities are both described uh, clearly and that they're temporary in nature. That this, to your point, doesn't uh, uh, become a simple one-way transition into providing a different level of authorities and rewriting the roles of boards and the roles of executives. Um, and in order to aid with this, uh, I would say uh, both executives and boards will need to activate uh, more informal as well as formal channels of communication between them because with many of these decisions, I think timeliness becomes uh, uh, quite important. And I think board members will need to um, expect uh, that the cadence and the, uh, the, the need for rapid response and rapid feedback uh, is a, a, a required feature for them to maintain that level of uh, authority. And then finally, this is possibly not a point for today, but definitely a point when we emerge, is it is quite important for those authorities and those decisions uh, that are taken throughout this process, that they're subject to some sort of post-mortem process uh, at the end, both to maximize the learning and the development for the organization and to adjust uh, in uh, items which may not have worked as, as planned. 
Um, the one thing that I think underlies all of this is um, trying to manage the risk of two extremes. And the two extremes are um, management encroaching on the role of boards um, at the expense of corporate governance and at the, at the expense of decision making. But there's also another risk and another extreme. And the other extreme is that board members, um, because of the exceptional nature of these circumstances, end up managing uh, the business. Um, and I think while there's certainly a role for the board to play, this is probably the least time that you need board members who are non-executive trying to manage uh, 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 the business. Um, they, the boards will almost certainly need more regular updates from management. Um, both the frequency of meetings may increase as well as updates between meetings uh, may increase. Uh, management will also have an expectation for boards to be more responsive and more timely with their responsive and uh, uh, their feedback because of the urgency of a lot of these decisions. Uh, but it's ultimately a delicate balance. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, I agree with you. I think um, it's going to be a testing time for some board directors who sit on many, many boards and uh, uh, you know that their time is going to be severely strained, I think. Um, I've got one last question for you before we pass on to the, the Q&A from participants. Um, how do you see the long-term impact of COVID-19 for the financial markets? How are investors in Saudi Arabia reacting? And do you foresee any changes to the trading rules going ahead? Uh, well, this is a point that I think we try to spend a lot of time in the, in, in the CMA trying to uh, uh, think about, uh, both in terms of the implications of the crisis and the implications beyond the crisis. And if, I, if we look beyond the, the, the current crisis, uh, I think um, the, what we're experiencing right now will possibly have implications for the financial markets, both globally as well as locally here in Saudi Arabia. So if we first start talking about the implications globally, I think um, number one, um, even before the, 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 the COVID pandemic, um, there has been a, a fairly strong transition uh, between this notion of shareholder primacy uh, to this uh, more balanced approach of stakeholder management. And I think what we have been seeing and what we have been experiencing have really manifested this idea is that corporates are corporates, but they are corporate citizens. So they are citizens first and corporates uh, second. And this more nuanced approach of balancing between shareholder obligations, employee obligations, and obligations to clients, and society at large, I think is likely to accelerate. Actually, what we're experiencing right now and what we're living through today, experiencing lockdown, is a prioritization of health priorities over financial priorities. And I think we are likely to see the implication of this long beyond uh, the period that we're experiencing right now. Um, the second uh, impact for financial markets globally is a bit of good news because uh, we're familiar with the crisis in 2008 when the financial markets were a major cause of the global crisis. Uh, in, in this current crisis, uh, this is not uh, the the uh, 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 the financial markets are a supporting character and not the main character. And I think the key word here is support. So the question is, can we as a financial market? continue to support the global economy in securing financing, in uh, securing liquidity for businesses and countries that are in dire need. And, and I continue to be hopeful of that. Um, if I then just move from the global context to, the, to more of the local context, I would say actually the, 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 the capital markets in Saudi Arabia, if we just compare the reaction of the capital markets now uh, with the reaction of the capital markets in a previous crisis like the uh, global financial crisis of 2008, I would say the, the financial markets have fared rather well. And if I can just draw a parallel between the two, um, in 2008, the global financial crisis, 
the epicenter of the global financial crisis was uh, the U.S. economy. It spread from there to the rest of the world, but it was largely, in, or at least initially, U.S. centric. Uh, the Saudi economy, on the other hand, was relatively far removed economically in terms of economic impact from the financial crisis. There was a bit of um, indirect impact via a decline in oil prices, but it was an indirect impact. In spite of this, we, we saw in 2008 that the volatility that emerged in the financial market in Saudi Arabia and the decline that occurred in the financial market in Saudi Arabia was actually higher than uh, 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 the, the volatility and the decline witnessed in the US uh, capital market, which was the epicenter of the crisis. This time around, and 12 years later, um, this is a, uh, 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 this crisis has this an economic impact uh, in all countries of the world, including Saudi Arabia. It has both direct and indirect uh, impact, both directly in the local economy, as well as indirectly through the impact on uh, oil prices. However, at the same time, we've seen this time around, the volatility of the Saudi market and the downside risk of the Saudi market has been somewhat lower than we've seen in, in other markets. And while it's still early to, too early to tell and to, uh, to decide uh, where we stand as it relates to the entire duration of the crisis, we believe that this has something to do with the diversification of the investor base that has occurred over the last uh, period, um, which has been helpful. I would also like to mention that uh, most countries in the world have um, uh, restrictions, and, and this is to your second point on trading rules. Most countries in the world have um, uh, uh, precautions in place to control volatility, whether it's volatility limits or trading curves. Um, the Saudi market applies a daily volatility limit of 10% up or down, and we've applied this throughout. It has actually been quite encouraging for us uh, that those daily volatility limits have only been tested once during this crisis, and markets have actually receded within the same trading day uh, to beyond or below these trading limits. So this has given us a degree of confidence as to, so far, the sufficiency and the adequacy of the uh, uh, volatility control mechanisms in place in Saudi Arabia. But of course, we continue to monitor the situation to see if any additional precautions uh, will need to be put in place. Your Excellency, thank you. Um, let's move on. We've got a lot of questions from um, the attendees, um, and I'm going to um, work my way through some of them now. There's, there's quite a few questions um, trying to understand how reducing the trading hours um, would help and and why that uh, decision was made. Perhaps you so can that's elaborate. A, sure, that's a very good question. So um, um, if, if we recall the sequence of events in Saudi Arabia, we had a, uh, a, a lockdown period that was overnight uh, and then the lockdown period, at least in Riyadh, moved from the evenings to 3 p.m. Uh, and I think at that point in time, um, we and our colleagues in Tadawa, the exchange, had a choice to make. Do we maintain the same um, trading hours or do we uh, change uh, the trading hours? And I think at that time, we elected to shorten the trading hours to give market participants, particularly essential staff, enough time to move to their place of business, uh, which some of them will still need to conduct their business in their uh, place of business on the exchange or in financial market participants and back uh, before the uh, uh, quarantine period or the lockdown period closes down. And we actually chose the trading, the, new, uh, the newly reduced trading period uh, so that it can tolerate even if we move to a 24 hour lockdown situation. And to our expectations, that is indeed what happened. We moved from a 3 p.m. lockdown to a 24 hour p.m. lockdown, and we didn't actually need to trade our trading rules. So I think the new shorter trading day uh, can be sufficient and can provide enough robustness and enough manpower capacity to be able to serve the market indefinitely, um, even with a 24 hour lockdown. So it was really a safety uh, and, and, and security issue more than a volatility control issue. 
Um, Your Excellency, there's a question here about um, the increase in the risk of fraud at a time like this. Do you see um, such a, a heightened uh, risk of greater fraud? And does that also imply a heightened risk of maybe liability for directors and officers during this time in the way they're managing their organizations and ensuring they've got adequate controls? Um, what we, I mean, I would say that uh, uh, um, we ultimately believe that people are good uh, intrinsically, but that they do, they can do bad things. Um, so uh, in circumstances uh, like these, when you have, uh, particularly in circumstances when you have more authorities that are delegated or fewer checks and balances or fewer uh, 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 company staff are available. I think both senior executives in companies as well as the boards themselves will need to be uh, exceptionally vigilant uh, with respect to make, making sure that no uh, malfeasance uh, takes place and or that no one takes advantage of, of these opportunities. And I can certainly say that our level of enforcement with respect to more serious cases has increased over the last period, not necessarily because it occurs, because I think we need to become more vigilant in situations like this. Uh, there's a question which sort of uh, moves on from there, and that is we've talked about um, board committees and the importance of, you know, good governance, etc., continuing at a time like this. There's a question as whether board committees should still be meeting. How do you, what do you, what's your feeling on that? Um, so, uh, I think it's very difficult to draw a general rule for all committees, um, uh, but um, if I use just one example, which is the audit committee, I think the audit committee should definitely be meeting on a regular basis, and maybe even uh, it, it, in certain cases, it may need to increase its level of involvement. Now, it may not necessarily need to follow the same uh, schedule that it had previously and the same audit plan that it followed previously because circumstances change, but a committee like the audit committee and maybe possibly others will need to increase their involvement, uh, albeit change their scope to things that are genuinely supportive in this time period. Do you see any um, board of directors creating a special committee to oversee the company's response to the pandemic? Or do you think, again, um, it's the role of the full board, not a special committee? So I would say that uh, uh, ultimately there is broadly a consensus with respect to the fact that there needs to be some level of team-based work uh, to deal with the pandemic. However, the current consensus is that team-based work needs to focus on the executives of uh, the board, uh, the, the executive members of the company and not the non-executive members because Again, the risk is if you create a committee, there is a natural tendency for that committee to want to delve more deeply into uh, uh, the executive role of the company. Uh, it also becomes a, a method to provide infrequent or improper information between board members so that some board members have information and other board members don't have uh, the, the same information. I think one can increase the frequency of in which the board meets, but I think one should try to be cautious about using this as an opportunity to, for the board to encroach on the role of management. Um, there's a question here um, for Your Excellency. How is the CMA coordin coordinating its uh, reactions uh, with SAMA to address the challenges uh, being faced in the financial industry? So we have actually been very close to our friends and colleagues in uh, SAMA from very, very early on in the process. Uh, we have direct interactions uh, with them on almost a daily basis. And we also have a formal umbrella for a lot of our interactions that help us um, uh, raise certain issues and make uh, questions collectively. Uh, and that umbrella is the Financial Stability Committee of Saudi Arabia, which combines ourselves uh, our colleagues in SAMA, as well as our colleagues in the Ministry of Finance to look at the, some of the, fis the fiscal implications of, uh, of what's been happening right now and their implications on the financial system. And we have certainly increased 
our level of interactions, uh, and we have found our interactions with them to be um, fairly uh, uh, enlightening to the both of us because we have found that they uncover risks in the capital market and we've been able to uncover potential risks in the banking system because we uncover we look at the world from different uh, perspectives so it's been a very very helpful uh, experience um i think that there are some questions saying um asking about um the, the, the how you see the con continuation of this pandemic and its impact. We know what we know now, um, but there is a general feeling that this we're not out of this yet. We're not even at the peak yet. That this is going to get worse. So, um, what what other measures may you be considering at the CMA as if the situation gets worse? And uh, and then on a more optimistic note. Um, how do you see the CMA supporting recovery when it comes? Well, uh, uh, so I would say, um, I mean, the, the, the tendency in um, circumstances like this is to naturally want to gravitate towards extremes, um, either to say that this is nothing and we'll, um, you know, we'll get through this very quickly, it'll have minimal impact, so we need to do very little, or that you're prone to the other extreme, that this is catastrophic and you know, the, the, you know, the, 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 you know, the world will not end uh, uh, after uh, the crisis, um, and, and yet everything will not stay the same. And I think the, the challenge is to always be in this middle ground and to decide in which areas do I need to be a little bit more concerned in which areas um, I need to be a little bit more optimistic. And I think the, the best saying that I've ever heard in this regard is um, an old uh, lady once said, you know, it, 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 you're never doing as well as you're doing when you think you're doing really, really well. And you're never doing as bad as you think you're doing when you think you're doing really, really bad. And I think that's very helpful advice for individuals and businesses were going through uh, this experience. But I think the, the other key word is um, scenario planning. We have, a, 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 like most businesses in the CMA, we have a crisis management team uh, that's in place. We meet uh, on a daily basis. We actually just got off the call, I just got off the call before this uh, conference call this morning. And I think we have a, 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 a list of parameters that we look at uh, on a daily basis, some on a weekly basis, some on a bi-weekly basis, and uh, a risks of uh, concerned areas that uh, we always uh, like to have a handle on. I think so far, we, we see that things are uh, quite stable from a financial market standpoint. I think the main wave that we need to think about is um, the, the, the real impact to the economy, which will become increasingly clear as companies start to disclose their financials. And I think the, that is likely to be the second wave of uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, both sizing the, the magnitude of the situation and dealing with any issues that might arise. And that's the phase that we're preparing for now. We've got um, some questions here about companies going for listing this year. Um, should they postpone or is it business as usual? Well, uh, I would say there are two answers to this. Number one is from a regulatory perspective and from the CMA's perspective, it is by all means business as usual. So the CMA continues to accept applications for companies that want to list. Uh, it accepts applications for corporate actions. As a matter of fact, what we've started to see an increase in is a uh, fixed income market. So companies are looking to explore um, fixed income and debt issuance options as an additional means of financing. Some of the work that we've did over the past few years is hopefully going to bear fruit in terms of simplifying companies' to access to credit, not just from the banks, but also from uh, the capital market. So from a regulatory and operationalist impact, I think it, it, it is by all means um, uh, uh, business as usual, albeit remotely. Uh, I think from a business perspective, it will vary by from business to business. So um, uh, there 
are, there are certainly some businesses that will be severely impacted by uh, uh, the implications of uh, what we're experiencing right now. And some businesses will not likely want to list for the first time in a period that's not a good period. And generally, it's been the case that listing is not a good avenue for companies that don't have visibility to how they can achieve profitability. However, by that same token, we've also seen uh, a good number of businesses that have been beneficiaries of what's been happening over the past uh, period, particularly online businesses, uh, technology-based businesses, businesses in certain verticals, where these businesses actually are uh, supporting the economy and supporting um, people uh, very rapidly and have been seeing a growth in their business. And for those businesses, the main constraint has actually been financing. And actually some of the discussions that we continue to have is how do we continue to support these businesses so that uh, capital is not a constraint, so they can grow and they can continue to serve clients and, and society at large without having capital as a constraint. And that's something that we would like to continue to do. Um, there's a question here. This is always the tricky one. Um, employees losing their jobs, reduction in salaries, furloughs across the globe. Um, do you think that employees should bear the burden of this uh, systemic risk um, or is, should investors bear that burden? Um, that's a, a, I think that's a very, very good question. And I think that's, a, uh, um, a, a, that's a, 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 an existential question for many businesses. And I would say that it's very, very difficult to decide on a one-size-fits-all for all businesses. If you are a business that generates 60% margin and high degree of profitability, and who the, the bulk of which employees are on sustenance level, then maybe you can bear a little bit of the, the cost uh, on behalf of those employees. If you're a business on the margin and that's struggling to exist, uh, maybe the solution you reach is somewhat different. And I think the moral of the story, and this is what's becoming abundantly clear in uh, uh, this environment, is that ultimately we are all in this together. And we are all in this together, whether you talk about employees versus shareholders, whether you talk about the economy versus health, or even when you think about different countries. I think that the... the the advantage is by working together and on compromises that achieve the least amount of pain to the most people is, is the way that we can arrive safely to the other side. And I'm sure and confident that we will. There's a question here about um, opportunities. And is this also a time, do you think, for corporate takeovers? Uh, so I think that's an excellent question. And um, as I said, um, um, people and corporates are generally prone to extremes, uh, either extremes of pessimism or extremes of uh, uh, negativity. And I think in this current market context, while we've talked a lot about risks and potential downside, uh, et cetera, I, I would caution everyone uh, that uh, these are also the environments that create the largest number of opportunities and the most significant opportunities. So um, in the financial market, there's a, a, a lesson where they say that uh, um, um, fear and greed are two sides of the equation. And most investors are schizophrenics and they move from extreme fear to extreme greed. And successful investors and indeed successful businesses and board members are ones who manage to keep both extreme emotions in check, to be greedy when people are fearful and to be fearful when people are greedy. And you are correct that uh, uh, there are generally opportunities in markets like this, whether it's to enter new areas or to consolidate industries. And this can be both in greenfield areas as well as in uh, uh, inorganic areas like m and And I think some of the work that we in the CMA have done over the past two years to effectively rewrite the m and regulations have created a flow of m and activities even preceding the m and uh, of uh, the, the current COVID crisis. And we think that that will be a tool that will be at the disposal of companies 
uh, emerging from the current context. You actually see there's a question here about um, the, the, the coming economic recession that we see globally. And how do you see the effect of this crisis on international investment flows into the kingdom? Um, so this has been an area where that has been a positive surprise um, uh, for us in Saudi Arabia. Because if you remember, uh, Saudi Arabia is fairly new to welcoming international investors. Saudi capital market was effectively closed off to international investors until 2015. And um, this is the first real global event where we see how international investors behave with respect to global events like this. And uh, we have been positively surprised um, by the numbers. And just if, if I can put it into perspective, um, the, the net inflows that came into Saudi Arabia uh, in 2019 was something around 100 billion riyals. Um, from the beginning of the year uh, until recently, and I didn't check the numbers in the last couple of days, but uh, there was possibly a net outflow of around 3 billion uh, Yes. And, and, and all of the data that I mentioned is publicly disclosed. Um, and so while there certainly has been some outflow by international investors, it hasn't been uh, significant. And one possible explanation for this is the, the, the increased growth in passive investing. And passive investing, which essentially tracks the index, um, essentially ensures that most of these investors continue to be invested as long as you... Uh, are a component of uh, the index. And we've certainly seen this to be the case. And so in that regard, I would say that international investors, at least in the first stages of the crisis, have actually been a stabilizing factor in, uh, uh, in the local capital market. And that's one of the features that has stabilized it compared with uh, 2000, the period of 2008. Uh, there have been some flows in and out, and some of the flows in and out have been largely attributable to um, certain global investors having different perception towards emerging markets and then having an outflow from all emerging markets or back in. So we've seen those flows, which creates additional linkages with the rest of the world that we need to manage that we didn't have before. But I would say broadly, it has been a stabilizing impact. There's a question here. Um, what is the CMA doing to help listed companies to benefit from government support? Um, so uh, we we were organizing a workshop yesterday with listed dedicated for listed companies, and that was actually the first question that one of the colleagues mentioned. Um, uh, so we have seen over the past few weeks a slew of announcements by different government institutions trying to provide certain elements of support uh, in their areas, whether it's in deferrals, relaxing some requirements, uh, uh, financial support, etc. cetera. Um, and in discussions with a lot of these areas, most of these government institutions have their own mechanisms for applications. So some of them have a website, some of them have a dedicated portal, uh, et cetera. We have found that it is generally more helpful and more expedient for firms to directly interface with these support providers directly uh, because time is of the essence. And I think in, 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 in many of these cases, you want to cut out the middleman. But we've also called on publicly listed companies that do uh, have issues that they require our support on, that they not hesitate to let us know, and that we can provide some support in that regard because it is a broad consensus by the economy overall that we need to prioritize both small and medium businesses as well as publicly listed firms. Uh, small and medium businesses because we're trying to help uh, small businesses grow and become the next large businesses and publicly listed firms because they have both governance and the disclosure to ensure their continuity as a contributor of the economy. They also represent the interests of many, many investors rather than a concentrated small group of investors. And those really have justified in many instances, whether with our involvement or without, um, giving precedence to um, publicly listed firms. And we've seen this manifest itself not just in words, but even if you look at the, the new government procurement program, 
it actually very explicitly places in, uh, an, an emphasis and a priority on small and medium businesses and on public real estate firms. Um, a question here about um, investment investment tools. Are there um, some investment tools for individuals during this crisis, uh, which would, this is from uh, Reem. Does that, does that question make sense to you? Yes, uh, I, uh, th I think that's a very, very opportune question. And I used to be a, a, a very active in the area of investment advisory for the duration of my career. Unfortunately, in um, the current market context, I am now barred from providing investment advice. I think what I can say is um, we have started to see an expansion of available investment tools to investors. And it's actually been quite encouraging to see market participants themselves start to think about ways in which they can offer additional um, innovative uh, investment solution that fit investors' need, particularly in the current market context. And we're, starting to, we're, we're just now starting to see uh, investment firms think about that. I think maybe just uh, one last question, Your Excellency. I'll see if there's anything else that's um, burning uh, out there. But um, there's been quite a few questions about business continuity planning and um, whether that's regulated by the CMA and whether companies were, you know, really had these plans in place and how effective you've seen them uh, in, in action. Um, so uh, I would say that financial, for, in financial market firms, um, this is a regulated activity. So we do require that firms have business continuity plans in place uh, and that they test these business continuity plans periodically. Um, and while unfortunately you, you, you hope you never need it, this has been an instance where we have had the opportunity to test business continuity plans of firms in the financial sector. Uh, and it's been really a trial by fire for everyone. It has been very encouraging to see that with very, very few exceptions, uh, uh, firms have managed to function in uh, the financial market. I think they required some level of support because of the nature of the issue. So for example, we had a 24 hour lockdown uh, and because financial markets are deemed a critical function, we needed to provide exemptions to certain critical employees of these uh, employees because it would have been very difficult for them to transition um, to uh, home working 100% uh, while being able to maintain a fully functioning uh, market. And that uh, we understand. But I, I think the one thing I would like to say is that business continuity is not an end product. And this uh, is an opportunity to continue to iterate around your business continuity plans because we've, all, we've just now seen the first wave in, in the month or so that we've been since lockdown. But I think uh, there, there are likely to become more challenges as people start to think about things like paying payrolls, receiving shipments, uh, and, and, and the more the situation extends, the more likely it's going to trigger additional business continuity requirements. So I would say a big shout out to all of the risk management and business continuity professionals out there because this is your time to shine. And this is just the beginning. Um, Your Excellency, I think one last question and, and wrap up. Uh, we, we've uh, run out of time. Um, what, what do you think are the lessons learned so far? And I know we're still early into the stages of this. And um, any, any other uh, messages that you would like to share with the participants today? Yeah, uh, I, I would say, uh, I mean, it's still early in the process to try and derive lessons. One likes to derive lessons in the uh, uh, calm platitude of uh, 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 you know, ref reflective view. Um, uh, after something has ended. But I think um, the, the key lesson right now is the high emphasis on flexibility and the high emphasis on iteration and, uh, and interaction between different stakeholders, in, in both within the company and outside of the company, as well as interactions with ourselves. Mm -hmm. 
many of the interventions that we have made ourselves uh, are actually, some of them have been things that we've thought of, but other, a lot of them have been things that the market participants have come to us with. So I would like to take this opportunity to call on everyone involved. Please, uh, if there's anything that we can help with, come talk to us. Uh, all of our contacts are on our website. Uh, drop us a line, let us know. And if there's anything we can do to support, uh, we would be happy to, because we, all, we are ultimately in this together. Your Excellency, thank you very much. We have come to the end of our time. I think that the feedback um, that we've received both through the chat and the Q&A has been excellent. Um, we have recorded this session. Um, we will share it with you and we will share it with everybody who's joined us today. Thank you very much indeed. I will also share with you at the CMA all the questions that we received. And uh, if you, you know, you can add them to your FAQs on your website if you wish. But thank you very much um, on behalf of everybody today. Will do. Thank you very much, Jane, and thank you everyone for attending and hope you all stay safe. Please, you too. Thank you very much.